Hi everybody, my name is Adrian Smith. I'm a researcher at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you. Thanks for tuning in. And then once I've sh shared my screen, I can begin um, my contribution to the to this STRN NEST doctoral school in methodologies and methods of sustainability transitions research. Um, I'm really grateful to Bono and Julia for inviting me to say something in relation to this, this session on researching paradoxes in transformative innovation and sustainability transitions, because um, it's really made me think uh, about some research I've been doing recently with a colleague in Argentina called Mariano Fresoli about post-automation. The task Bono and Julia set us was to talk to you about an encounter we've had with a paradox in relation to our research, a paradox that maybe intrigued us or even haunted us, and then to, you know, talk about that and then get into how we approach this paradox methodologically and then reflect on some implications, maybe for policy or for research, and maybe how our methods came to, to matter there. So that's the sort of structure of what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to try and relate that to this, this, this puzzle around post-automation, if you like. Now, just to kind of get us started um, on a relatively sure footing, I understand a paradox to be a seemingly contradictory statement that proves to be well-founded, if you like. So there's a sort of tension or contradiction there. And for me, it's this, um, I was sort of following in relation to some research I was doing around kind of grassroots sort of digital innovations and um, which I'll, I'll talk about soon, um, was getting frustrated in a lot of the kind of public discourse that we've been having around the fourth industrial revolution uh, and um, media and, and, and popular concerns. I mean, well-founded around um, automated futures, you know, particularly in relation to us losing our jobs and so forth, that the future was gonna be more automated. Maybe it will be. But if you like, the paradox of me was um, that there's really nothing automatic about automation. These futures are kind of socially shaped and constructed. So why are we also sure that the future will be automated? So if you like, that's the paradox I want to explore. There's nothing automated, automatic about automation. That's the thing that's been haunting me, if you like. How do I go about interrogating this paradox? Well, I suppose loosely, I mean, I didn't use um, sustainability transitions sort of frameworks or the methodologies um, specifically, but having worked on things like the multi-level perspective in the past and found concepts like um, niche spaces, particularly useful and still useful for a lot of the research I've been doing. Um, that was sort of implicit, at least, in how I engaged with uh, some of these automation debates and the uh, development of a concept with my colleague Mariano of post-automation. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So in terms of methodologies, I guess, the first thing, A, and the first part of what I'm going to say is about deconstructing regime narratives, you know, challenging the power of quite naturalised future essentialism. This is how the future is going to be. And that's the sort of automation debates. Then second, another methodological move, if you like, is to explore alternatives and bring attention to those marginal alternatives that perhaps trying to think about futures or about transformations quite differently, going about them quite differently. And that's this post-automation concept, which I'll talk about. And then the third aspect is, and this is where I'm going to finish the talk, really with some questions and invite your help and feedback and what you think about it. Is, is, is it possible to talk about and explore these alternatives without slipping back into a kind of future essentialism? And this sort of relates to, you know, the, the kind of backcasting um, in transitions governance, where, you know, rightly, I think, we, we think about constructing or mobilising alliances and, and activities around long-term visions for sustainability. And then using that to kind of backcast back to present day experimentation, 
and thinking about doing things differently and changing some of the rules of the game and cultivating these spaces and so forth. And I just want to wonder whether in that, even if we try and construct these visions in a very participatory way and, and we um, can be very iterative and reflexive about what we're doing in terms of, you know, thinking forwards, looking back to the present and so forth, this dynamic, how to kind of do that without falling into this trap of future essentialism, if you like. Okay, so that's that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about now what we've been doing around this idea of post automation and and automation. It may take me a little bit of time, so please sort of bear with me because hopefully it's of interest uh, to this broader kind of methodological issue that Bono and Julia are, are taking you through around paradoxes. That's my hope anyway. So first of all, automated futures and automation is a powerful narrative in industrial societies, definitely, has been for a very, very long time, okay? And there's this sort of notion that it's up to societies to adapt to uh, automated futures. And that's been kind of revived in recent years with a, the kind of um, installation and increasing influence of digital technologies in our lives, and that we're gonna be in getting into increasingly automated futures. But it's not a new, uh, future narrative. So we've got a quote here that defines what we mean by automation in a very general sense that was given to us by Liam Bagrip, who was an engineer. And this was a public lecture he delivered in 1964 about the age of automation. So he says that automation is a concept through which a machine system is caused to operate with maximum efficiency by means of adequate measurement, observation and control of its behaviour. It involves a detailed and continuous knowledge of the functioning of the system so that the best corrective actions can be applied immediately they become necessary. And he talked about take, making use of the, the three C's of new, um, new technologies, what we now call digital technologies. So the, the affordances of these technologies for computation, communication and control. And we see that still now largely in um, narratives, discourse and, and, and missions for the, the fourth industrial revolution which you can see on the on the right here, where the point is to take some of these technological affordances and use them um, for the purposes of, you know, enhancing labour productivity, instilling a new wave of capital accumulation and growth, so important for our industrial political economies, and actually that these technologies can enhance managerial control, including managerial control over environments and ecosystems. OK, so in the fourth industrial revolution, there's a lot of talk about how automation and the logics of automation can enable more productive, ecologically modern cyber physical systems. OK, I'll go into that a little bit more soon. Interestingly, on the political left, there's been some really intriguing debates about fully automated luxury communism. So seeing in these technologies, um, that automation is the future and that's something to be embraced and indeed accelerated because the productive capacities of these automated systems that go from now are going you know beyond the conventional concerns of the workplace and the home to the automation of cities the automation of health systems professional services education warfare and so forth okay so automation is sort of rolling out in this new wave to much much greater and wider application the ambitions are much more um, uh, well, ambitious, much more uh, significant, if you like. So on the left, for fully automated luxury, we need to um, accelerate that. And they argue for counter hegemonic strategies for winning kind of state control to shape these, the automation developments and make sure that they're more socially progressive, if you like, that the benefits of material abundance through automation, that's again, sustainable because it's very eco managed in an ecologically modern way. Um, these are, this can fund or support universal basic services and incomes at a very high level. Indeed, there's an argument that, you know, you insist on high levels of universal basic income to make labour costly and therefore in, induce even more automation beyond levels that capital would be kind of comfortable with, if you like. So there's this post-scarcity technology acceleration, and this is facilitated through sort of democratic state control. So that's a sort of automated future kind of debate and narrative, if you like. 
And there's a lot of future essentialism about this. So Casper Schollin did, wrote a really interesting paper a couple of years back now, talking about this future essentialism in the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, this very powerful vision. It's in fact, it's, it's, it's a vision that's so powerful that it looks like this is the future, uh, so the kind of inevitability about it. And the questions then are about how to adapt our societies to automated futures. Okay, so Casper defines future essentialism as these sort of discourses, narratives, and visions that through different means and practices, historical analyses, speculative estimates, hard statistics, and calculation, produce and promote an imaginary of a fixed and scripted, indeed inevitable future. And that can be desirable if harnessed in an appropriate and timely fashion, but is likewise dangerous if humanity fails to grasp its dynamics. Okay, so there's a sense that future essentialism sort of short circuits a lot of its social choices in technological futures. You know, the technology, technological future is sort of set, it's automation is going to be a big part of our lives and then the question is how do we adapt to that how do we make sure it's socially and environmentally sustainable you know those are the sort of debates within say fourth industrial um, revolution discourse and indeed a very practical issues in terms of policy for industry 4.0 for example so you know automation is deliberately cast as inevitable or desirable destiny that demands investment this technological frontier promises productivity, control, and accumulation of new wealth. And that's indeed these, these, these kind of fundamental um, goals are naturalized, if you like. That's what development's all about, improving and boosting labor productivity, enhancing our managerial control over things and, and, and accumulating greater wealth. And indeed, social and ecological challenges are conceived within this automation framework. So rising inequality concerns there will be managed through training, training us and future workers to be the operatives and designers of these automated systems. Uh, welfare policies like universal basic income, a lot of research and debate over the new jobs that will be created by the rollout of these automated service uh, systems, yeah, or the new tasks and just how many tasks or and therefore, jobs eventually will be destroyed through automation, how many will be created, how do we manage that in a policy sense. And similarly, ecological um, collapse is seen through the lens, if you like, or the framing of this essentialized future. It will be reduced or held off through green technologies, through improvements in material science and better control of ecosystems and our relationships with ecosystems. But maybe there's reasons for questioning some of those, um, that vision, if you like. So this is one, one method, if you like, for getting into this paradox and, and actually suggesting that there's nothing automatic about these automated futures because research shows that the technical ability to automate historically and maybe currently need not automatically lead into its pr practical implementation at full scale. So a lot of research that's questioning some of the more alarming uh, uh, estimates about how many jobs will be lost to automation by auto, auto, for example, and notes that, you know, actually a lot of tasks are very difficult to automate and that maybe jobs will be um, restructured, but they won't necessarily disappear. And indeed, there's research into the ghost work, the kind of human work that has to go into training data, fixing bugs, managing interfaces with uncertain and non-compliant non realities in cities, in workplaces and so forth, okay, to try and make the, the, um, uh, uh, the automated systems work, yeah, the kind of hidden human labor beneath and within them. And of course, these digital technologies can be used in very financialized ways, particularly with disorganized labor to create very precarious micromanagement of jobs. So, you know, we're familiar a lot with some of the concerns around gig economy, platform capitalism, and how these digital technologies are not necessarily displacing humans' work and jobs, but are almost like turning humans into, into robots by micromanaging increasingly their, their tasks and their work. And so a lot of res empirical research, historical research shows that, you know, the, the, the extent and the shape of automation is really determined or influenced by very complex 
interactions between labour processes, business models and political economies. And it's this that shapes these patterns of automation. So rolling out automation, whether it's within the sort of um, vision of the fourth industrial revolution or whether it's the fully automated luxury communist um, uh, counter hegemonic strategy, if you like, you know, this needs political as well as economic support. It may not be implemented as full as we would like. And indeed, that's what the fully automated luxury communists are insisting on. Yeah, that actually, this is a political project and needs to be accelerated for the benefit of all. But there's also a question of, you know, research, whether this vision will actually be fully in control as well. As I said, the fourth industrial revolution and fully automated luxury communism both address ecological relations as matters of, of technological in control. Ecologies will be become objects to be integrated into the total management of systems. Ecosystems are, are, are framed as resources, processes, sinks and services that become in part of our productive and consumptive systems within the fourth industrial revolution. Okay. But there's, again, empirical research kind of cautions against this excessive instrumentality, indeed, some of this sort of technological hubris. Because we know that resource efficiencies at the technology scale do not necessarily lead to decoupling of environmental impacts at the system scale. Enhanced efficiencies and enhanced managerial control can lead to enhanced exploitation rather than controlled sufficiency. Okay, so this is something that's been pointed out, for example, within a lot of degrowth and post growth debates that, you know, relative decouplings that we may have experienced in recent years um, are not leading to absolute decoupling, decoupling. And indeed, as you can see in the image on the top right here, we're actually maybe getting recoupling between economic growth and development and environmental impacts. And we also have research that suggests that, you know, complex ecologies kind of bewilder and, and um, are just too complex for total control strategies of this automation vision. You know, living worlds respond in very dynamic and uncertain ways to our activities and interventions, our systems ambitions. Humans and non-humans are lively subjects that can ex escape comprehensive calculation and control. That's something particularly that we learn from, you know, feminist kind of research studies. So maybe the challenge is to think about the future in terms of matters of care rather than control, okay? So that's the first kind of um, methodological move, if you like, is to try and question some of the future essentialism in automation. That the full implementation of automation has to be built politically as well as technically. And if it's being built politically, maybe we can challenge it politically as well as a strategy for doing technology politics. You know, it's trying to create a persuasive vision and program that mobilizes alliances and investments that gets universities buying into and, you know, and funders of research to build around the fourth industrial revolution and so on and so forth. It's a very powerful narrative, but it's a narrative that intriguingly might coolly when, when criticizing automation debates in the 1980s, called present tense technology. These are visions of automation of futures that promise to perpetuate existing economic and political structures. They claim to be disruptive, disruptive innovations, but they're actually quite conservative of underlying structures that could be problematic in terms of sustainable developments and inclusive developments, yeah? Um, it's really about, and maybe transforming these deeper structures means rethinking our foundations for technology and questioning some of the assumptions that are in these automated futures. Meanwhile, fully automated luxury communism on the left promotes this accelerationist narrative, but as with other accelerationist narratives on the left historically, it's precisely unclear how and at which points this acceleration of technologies within capitalist structures transcend and flip or evolve into socialist futures and technologies you know so there's some questions here at the better bottom of this slide you know when where and how does capital automation transcend into communist automation who's going to do the redesigning the innovating the maintaining of communist side of the physical systems which democratic processes will recognize and transmit society's aspirations into these automated systems of production 
the, the, for the, there for the benefit of all and run by states how will non-human species and our common our co ecologies participate in these automated systems there's some really important questions here around technology politics that cannot but simply be automated and left to um, the decision makers of 4AR and FALC okay so I've been talking to about, about one aspect of the methodology there. So there's this kind of critique, deconstruction, uh, and and um, re, you know making apparent some of the complexities that are within this sort of future vision, this future essentialist essentialism of automation. The other methodological move is to point to alternatives. Okay, and that's what. Um, you know, I've been doing with some of my research and other people have been doing. Uh, and if you like, the move that Mariano and I've made is to kind of try and label that or to try and propose a concept called post automation to try and, if you like, open up our imaginations to contest this future essentialism, to think of futures beyond beyond the logics of, of automation, if you like, but nevertheless, based around sort of similar technologies. And so what we find within industrial societies, at least, is the creation of really interesting industrious spaces. And here we draw on work by Adam Arvidsson, who's written a lot about and thought a lot about these industrial spaces. And he sees them as really a kind of byproduct of industrial societies, industrial restructuring, relocation, including you know, advances in automation and investments in automation is creating on its margins new groups that are practicing quite different approaches and intriguingly practicing them, making use of some of the digital technologies that are um, being used in within industrial societies. So there are workers who are not absorbed into the well-paid industrial jobs, you know, including in the new centers of um, uh, industrial production in the global south you know migrants arriving to industrial the new industrial cities there and not finding the employment uh, but having to earn livelihoods there's also the service and professional jobs in the global north that are being newly automated or rendered precarious um, and skilled tech, tech workers at that heart of uh, automation if you like who are being alienated or dissatisfied with their jobs in automation and Alveson argues that, you know, these sort of very different groups are being like forced out by some of these dynamics in industrial society and almost being forced together to try and uh, are engaging in what he calls commons based petty production using some of the new digital technologies. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit about this soon. But essentially what they're doing is in having to develop quite informal livelihoods small scale economic activities that look quite different or certainly not the thing you know the kind of um, things celebrated in the fourth industrial revolution they're engaged in a lot of social innovation and social entrepreneurship using these technologies and they're and also involved in hacking and techno political activism and trying to envisage different futures with some of these digital technologies as well now a lot of this is out of necessity and it's not to sort of we shouldn't romanticize this stuff or um but but actually exploring and accompanying and pointing to what people are doing with technologies and a different kind of technology politics may help us think beyond automation okay and think about other kinds of uh of futures and visions uh some of which may be more socially and environmentally sustainable and the point is this industrial space is below the radar of a lot of industrial strategy and innovation policy in many countries and in many societies but nevertheless perhaps it's doing significant things with technologies you know it's a space where this future essentialism is questioned and perhaps alternatives develop to be a bit more specific perhaps futures are being opened where and here these bullet points list some of them okay so digital technologies associated with automation are actually being appropriated subverted and put to quite different uses that challenge some of the foundation or assumptions of automation so they're not being used in ways that are necessarily enhancing labor productivity managerial control capital accumulation they're being put to very different purposes 
technologies and devices like sensors, microcontrollers, digital fabrication, internet of things and so forth. And we see in spaces around common space peer production, you might think about hacker spaces, maker spaces, or in digital social innovation, the citizen sensing projects, where people are using these devices to try and visualize and map and monitor different relationships with ecologies. Okay, so better appreciations perhaps of the role of bees in their lives or birds and nature in the cities. And this isn't to try and enclose and internalize these natures into automated systems of production and consumption. No, it's trying to use these technologies to sensitize and re-signify our relationships with natures and our positions already in natures rather than this managing force somehow out of beyond that's controlling natures. There's all sorts of projects around fixing, right to repair and making technologies more durable and rethinking maintenance and care towards our productive and consumption systems. All sorts of interesting use of platforms in a techno-political way, you're using some of these technologies to uh, practice more direct democracy at scale or the creation of platform cooperatives or ways of organizing workers more effectively to resist some of the kind of platform capitalist gig economy kind of um, uh, ways of organizing and so forth. And then also interesting uh, attempts to kind of decolonize these technologies and think about digital autonomy or how some of these technologies may, may link to futures beyond the modernity of the West, okay, amongst indigenous groups or in different parts of the world. And so if you like the methodological move here is to try and and it's a risky one, is to conceive this as these capabilities that allow people to perhaps open up futures and think about futures beyond automation, not, not necessarily temporally, but more beyond its assumptions, its foundations of automation, and to think about futures that may be more sustainable, maybe more convivial, um, with some of these technologies and then and then that feeds back into questions about well what's what which of these sorts of technologies are appropriate which are not how might different technological futures be promoted and encouraged and we kind of use this term post-automation if you like as a shorthand as a concept to try and capture and draw attention to these diverse capabilities these subversive capabilities if you like so that's the other kind of methodological move for handling this paradox, if you like, that there's nothing automatic in automation. OK. And that, intriguingly, attempts to promote automation actually also create these these alternative spaces where people are trying to do things differently. OK, with different futures in mind, perhaps. And that's kind of captured in this this diagram, if you like, this sort of post automation space where digital affordances around computation, communication and control are actually being reconceived in perhaps ways around for conviv conviviality, collaboration and care and allowing people to maybe embed systems more in their territory, in their communities, in much more human centred and creative ways that allow them to do a lot more relational and care work. An interesting feature of a lot of these capabilities and these activities is they conceive technologies and what they're doing as a commons. And they're trying to do that in ways that's ecologically durable and dignified. Okay, so it's quite a different, they're trying to develop capabilities that are quite different to the emphasis in automation that's founded more around autonomous systems, accumulation and material abundance, managerial or state control. And it's all about labor productivity and accelerated technology and labor saving technology and indeed so we've kind of been trying to think and write about this you can then also uh, if you like contrast these automated futures of fourth industrial revolution for the automated communism with these sort of post-automation capabilities of trying to do open up futures much more so I won't go into the details of this um, table because I've been talking for quite a while now, but you know, the protagonists in the future look different. The strategies for the future are different. So less perhaps top, top down, less future 
essentialist, more about open experimentation and prototyping. The material basis for the future looks quite different. You know, the organizational basis, how it's organized and brought about, and that sort of temporality, okay? So whether it's about, you know, uh, present tense technologies I was talking about in the fourth industrial revolution, or acceleration and the fourth fully automated luxury communism, whereas maybe with post-automation, we're talking much more about present day subversions and cultivating the new sort of social ethos or something. You're welcome to pause it and look at this table in more, if it's interesting to you. So what's the implications in terms of this power, addressing this paradox about there being nothing automatic in automation, yeah? And actually, I think it leads us perhaps to um, another paradox, and this is where I want to leave you really, and, and <coughs> oh, I forgot about this slide, uh, with another paradox, but getting into that, as a sort of prelude to that, if you like, I, again, and just going through this briefly, what might a politics of post-automation look like? How are these um, people doing these sort of common based peer production, digital social innovation, and so on and so forth, engaging in politics? What's the politics there? And it works in sort of three areas, I think. One is as politics within innovation institutions, how innovation institutions, yeah, that promote innovation in part of society and invest in it and support it, how they kind of notice if they ever do some of these post-automation capabilities and activities and, and approach it, okay? And the politics there is about uh, engaging with institutions without being captured by them, if you like. There's also work with in social movements, if you like, and social change and how some of these post-automation capabilities are useful to some of the aims of social movements or how social movement ambitions to check for social change, maybe around sort of, anti-racism or gender or decarbonization or post-growth or what have you these demands put our conventional innovation institutions under pressure they challenge some of the priorities and the assumptions and ways of working and doing innovation in society and maybe that sort of leads to some reconfiguration that opens up opportunities for post-automation so there's a sort of dynamic between the first and second sites of politics here and then of course the really important third site of politics is around political economy and the relationships between markets states capital labor and um uh how these sorts of fundamentals kind of open up and create spaces for doing different kinds of economies if you like and so whilst i mean the fully automated luxury communists argue we should build our political economies around automation and indeed fourth industrial revolution sees the future of capitalist political economy in automation but post automation i don't think practitioners there are so um, seeing it in that way about building political economy They're practicing a different kind of politics I think and that kind of gets me to the, the this paradox if you like because this term this move we made to sort of label this heterogeneous cultural and economic activity as post-automation you know the protagonists themselves haven't uh, adopted this label or this concept they have diverse ideas about what they're doing and why and a lot of it might be you know personal projects trying to earn a livelihood and improve their circumstances or innovations that are more social and oriented towards their communities they may not necessarily have transformational aspirations it's about making do in the present so critics might reasonably argue there's no clearly focused pathway towards a post-automation future. We haven't got that cl clarity of vision. But if we want to, if part of the point here is to challenge future essentialism, is there a bit of a paradox that, you know, the most powerful visions in society involve essentialized futures, either around technology or about certain forms of sustainability. You know, and you're talking about vanguard political programs here of fourth industrial revolution or fully automated luxury communism. And actually trying to democratize the future involves distributing the capabilities to experiments, to prototype, to try and develop I mean, new, more sustainable 
livelihoods, but these are much more open visions about sustainability. They're almost like anti-programmatic in their politics. And that's something, you know, that I think we see in post-automation. And that's what Mariana and I kind of argue in some of our kind of thinking and writing on this. And so, I don't know, is there a paradox there that's pertinent to our transitions governance um, uh, process of visions and how they're developed and how we backcast and conceive the capabilities we're developing in the present towards more sustainable futures. And what's the role of a researcher in that? You know, do we move from our kind of transitions role of mapping and facilitating visions, backcasting and providing, you know, socio-technical analyses of experiments and niche spaces in the present to, I don't know, more distributional questions about capabilities for contesting futures and what's the role of researchers in, in, in helping or in exploring the circulation of those capabilities? And that's kind of where I leave you, really, in what's been quite a lot of um, uh, exploration of a paradox that's been haunting me, if you like. And I hope you found it interesting. Maybe there's some things that are uh, helpful or that um, give you reasons to think as well. And there's, there's nothing kind of conclusive of this. That's why I've put conclusions for now. I don't know, I was uncertain of putting this concluding slide, but essentially what I've said is, you know, automation is very powerfully situated politically and economically in our societies. But there's this paradox, I think, there's nothing automatic about automation. Future essentialism in automation means it's, ex its expansion is programmatic. It's about a lot politics aligning to this vision. Post-margin automation, the sorts of intriguing things on the margins, if you like, in these industrious spaces is marginal. Yet, I think is cultivating capabilities that could be really important for opening up more plural futures towards sustainability and learning how to live within sort of certain ecological constraints and sufficiency and develop more convivial societies. But to mobilize these post-automation capabilities, to see these circulating and expanding beyond these industrial industrious spaces, and to see them being incorporated into livelihoods and activities that are less precarious and less about making do and more transformational, does that mean we need to build a more powerful, almost essentializing narrative about the future? Or is it just enough to insist in the circulation of these capabilities for democratizing futures? And that's it. That's where I'll finish. I hope that prompts some interesting discussions. Please share your views and, and feedback to me. Um, if you want to know more about the post-automation work, there's a paper that should be coming out soon. We've just um, submitted the, mar the marginal kind of correction and can share that with you um, get in touch if you're interested and when that comes out we can share it with you but we did a workshop on this um, in September 2019 and this URL will link you to information about the workshop including some of the presentations that participants gave and a report that sort of touches on some of these themes so that's it thanks for sticking with me through this 30 minute uh, talk and um, yeah all the best with your own research <laughs>